This is one of a series of studies we've been doing over the years about how to prevent recurrent syncope. This one addressed uh, one particular high-risk subgroup, or there were lots of opinions, but no data. And that is, why do people who've lost two of their three conducting bundles in their heart faint? One possibility is the third one flickers from time to time, but there are numerous competing reasons. When we set out to design the study, there were two main approaches. One is just to put in a pacemaker and get on with it, and the other is to put in a tiny loop recorder wait and see what happens and act on the results of that. The uh, opinions were firmly held and we had vigorous debates about how to do the study. In the end, uh, we just did a one-on-one -on -one study to compare which of those two approaches work best in the long term. The study had two uh, unusual features about it. Uh, the first was that it was a pragmatic study. So it's a classic randomized study. Uh, but it was a pragmatic study with a capital P. Uh, there are 10 criteria for what a pragmatic study is, but the essence is to make something that looks like clinical practice. So you have broad inclusion criteria, as few exclusion criteria as possible, the f and then devolve as much of the responsibility for patient management study conduct down to the uh, enrolling centers. So for example, we didn't tell them exactly when they had to see their patients and follow up. We just suggested that they see them every six months or so as they usually would in their pacemaker clinic. The second unusual th uh, part of the study was the end point of the study. This was not a study designed to prevent fainting. This was a study designed to give us information on which is the wisest of the two courses over the next few years of the patient's life. So it captured not just fainting, but also whether or not patients needed a second operation, whether or not they had complications, and so on. So the study design was pragmatic. The study outcome was composite, not because we needed a composite outcome to capture lots of outcomes, because we needed a composite outcome, because a number of bad things can happen to people over the years. We expected that pacemakers would be a little superior. In fact, they were vastly superior uh, in the sense that far fewer patients had one of the composite outcomes if they received a pacemaker. Interestingly, this, the two approaches are identical in their ability to prevent fainting. The reason why the pacemaker approach worked is because so many of the patients who received a loop recorder ended up getting a pacemaker. Essentially, all of them ended up getting a pacemaker, except for the ones who died or had dementia or cancer or something like that. Clinical trials only give you information and knowledge. They don't give you judgment. Uh, they don't tell you what to do. What the trial does do is give solid information, robust data to practicing f physicians to discuss these with their patients. I think a lot of people will end up just moving over and putting in pacemakers. Some will still have a more nuanced approach to practice. The question in areas like the UK and the US, but not Canada, where f funders pay attention to what people do with their money. It may be that some procedures will be decommissioned, for example, because they're just not cost effective. We do have a cost study being presented tomorrow. There is a th another approach, and that is to do an invasive electrophysiologic study first. The reason why we didn't consider that is because I was quite impressed by the results of the issue study from 15 years ago that showed that doing an invasive study really was not terribly helpful. It's still recommended by the European Society of Cardiology, but we didn't look at that. What we did find, though, is that it's, a really, it's pretty safe to do this as an outpatient procedure. There's not much that happens in the first month or so that you can prevent with a hospitalization.